Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5, Heredity. This is video number 19, and we're just going to talk through the process of modelling meiosis. Now in this particular area of the topic, we are looking at conducting practical investigations to predict variations in the genotype of offspring by modelling meiosis, including the crossing over of homologous chromosomes, fertilisation and mutation. So this is the start of a new little section that we're going to be looking at, and we're particularly going to be looking at some of Mendel's uh, laws and also some of the other variations on the laws of inheritance that were founded uh, by the work of Mendel on pea plants. But before we do that, we just need to cross into one other little area that, that really focuses on the idea of variation. So um, this being a modelling kind of a process is something that you will, done, will do in class and, and obviously it's been part of your depth study as well. Um, but this is uh, where we're going to be looking at basically in this video, uh, focusing on sources of variation. So if you're looking at um, keeping a little track of what it is that you need to know from the end of this video, you should be able to model meiosis. So hopefully that's something that you can do already. Uh, you should be able to use a model of meiosis to explain a process known as crossing over. And that is something that you may have encountered in your depth study or in your readings up to now. Uh, but it may also be something new that we can focus on in this particular video. And uh, going beyond that, to discuss the ways in which variation within a species can be increased using specific examples and or models. Now, I'm not going to use three-dimensional models in this video. I'm just going to concentrate on the two-dimensional ones that you see on the screen. But we will um, play with 3D models, and some of you have already done that uh, already. So this particular video is going to focus on variability or variation. In your textbook, your Nelson textbook, The Biology in Focus, the authors describe variability as the different forms of a gene within a population. So the population is the important level that we're looking at here. That is the total of all alleles present in the gene pool of a population. So what are the uh, full range of possibilities, I guess, that we have available? When we look at variation, we can talk about the gene pool, the total number that we have available. We can also look specifically at the genes that you carry um, and whether we look at, at the expression of those genes in terms of the proteins that are produced or whether we talk more generally about traits like hair color or eye color, all of those sorts of things. There is a difference between looking at variation um, for a particular individual and how they differ from other individuals, and then looking at the total sum of what is available in the gene pool. And obviously, what's available in the gene pool won't always be present in every individual. So that's what we want to look at, some of the variability that can exist within the gene pool of a population and whether or not there are ways to increase that. Now, of course, it would be a very short video if the answer to that question is no, so the answer to that question is yes. And the first way and the, the one that we have looked at before is meiosis. So meiosis is the um, division that is a reducing division. That is, it takes the diploid number and reduces it to a haploid number. In humans, N is 23, so we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but only 23 chromosomes in our gametes, in our sperm or eggs. So that means that the whole purpose of meiosis is to reduce that uh, number of chromosomes. And of course, we know that the processes of meiosis and fertilization are complementary because the purpose of fertilization is to bring two of these ends together to produce um, an individual with the full complement again. So a sperm with 23 plus an egg with 23 would produce uh, a zygote and an embryo, which had uh, 46 chromosomes in the nucleus of its cells. So because there's choice about um, the individuals from where these come, and there's also um, some randomness about the way in which the chromosomes are uh, uh, sorted into the... This is a way of increasing variation. So you are, uh, genetically speaking, a product of your parents, your mother and your father. But when you produce your own gametes, it's not like all of your mother's... 
uh, chromosomes go into one egg or sperm and all of the uh, chromosomes from your father go into the other egg or sperm. There's a complete random way in which this happens. We actually have a name for that called random segregation and that is that all of these different chromosomes basically separate out um, independent of one another. They don't sort of recognize that all the chromosomes that were originally part of your mother don't all recognize each other and hang around together. They're completely random and this creates an increase in variability. Fertilization also does the same thing because um, you would know if you have siblings and even if you don't, um, brothers and sisters unless they're identical twins don't look alike and yet the same mother, the same father. So even within the same parents we can have variation in what um, appears in the offspring. And of course if you don't have the same mother and the same father then obviously the combinations continue to uh, increase and they'll increase exponentially with the number of people that we have or at least the number of individuals in any population. So the more individuals there are, the more our opportunity is for all this um, cross-breeding for people to come together or organisms to come together to mix their genetic material in order to again increase that variation. Now there's one very important um, process that occurs that we'll look at in a little bit more detail uh, called crossing over. And crossing over is pretty much uh, just a function of the fact that when two chromosomes are near one another, because we're just talking about chemical bonds, it's possible for them to actually uh, exchange genetic material from one chromosome to another. So therefore, even if, for example, this was a chromosome that came from your mother and this was a chromosome that came from your father, it may well be that in the gamete that's being produced, it's your mother's chromosome that's going in there, but it may have sort of a little, little region of your father's chromosome in there as well. That's an extra level of variation that is part of this process of crossing over. But we'll go through that in a little bit more detail here. And finally, mutation. Mutation, we're just going to look at as change. We now know that basically the genotype is about a series of bases, A's, T's, G's and C's. And any change in those can be reflected in a change, and possibly in a change in the amino acid sequence when the protein is produced. We will go into mutations in a lot more detail in the next um, module, but for now we'll just leave it as another way that variation can be increased. So here's crossing over. So cross crossing over is basically the process that involves the exchange of corresponding gene segments of non-sister chromatids between the homologous chromosome pairs. Welcome to biology. This is the kind of terminology that we need to start to become more comfortable with. So it's very important that you look at these regions where you're trying to um, identify where crossing over occurs. And this sort of a diagram, we've talked about modeling and this, when we're talking about modeling the process of meiosis, this is what we're talking about. We're specifically talking about drawing little models or building little models that show how this exchange can occur. And you can see colors really useful here because it stands out straight away that some of the blue stuff's gone on to the red one and some of the red stuff's gone on to the blue one. Now, the um, importance of crossing over comes a lot later on and I'll actually talk very briefly about this uh, in this video and it's probably a small extension so you can actually stop the video when we get to the point about gene mapping um, but what this does is it, re it produces things called recombinants which is basically a recombination of the gene sequence so not the original one but something that has changed and that idea of recombinants is very important and it's how we can increase the variation because, of course, we're going to be separating these out into uh, different cells. And so we're going to have these different combinations that are present uh, in each one of these uh, cells that's being produced, or at least potentially we are. So crossing over doesn't occur um, all the time in all places, um, but we can actually get a bit of a sense of how close two genes are together on a chromosome by working at how often they uh, recombine. And again, that's something that's part of uh, a uh, particular process called gene mapping, and we'll look at that later. One of the things that you want to be in the habit of doing is identifying the possible combination. So uh, this is, is fairly easy if we're only talking about one gene. Uh, but once we start to talk about multiple genes, then if the possibility of um, 
what's happening here is a cell which has A, B, C. And of course, we're not talking about A, A, B. One of the things that's really important when we're looking at our combinations is that we make sure that uh, we have one representative allele for each of the genes. You're going to have two for one and none for another. So this is the way that the system works uh, in order during the copying stage that we make sure that we get a copy of every gene. So when we get down to our actual potential cells that can be produced, you can see that uh, where I've split that first one is the same split here. So this would be a possible combination, A, capital A, capital B, capital C. Now we would only have two combinations if there was no um, crossing over. So the only possibilities we would get is big A, big B, big C, or little a, little b, little c. So you can see from our original um, chromatids that we have only those three combinations, uh, only those two combinations, big A, big B, big C, or little a, little b, little c. These would be the ones that would go into the gametes. But what's happened as a result of um, crossing over is we have two new possibilities that we didn't have before, and that's these ones that are kind of shown in the middle here. So because a small part of that uh, chromosome's genetic material was switched between the two chromatids, you now have a, uh, two more potential combinations that can occur in the gametes, and that's big A, big B, little c, or little a, little b, big C. So that's what recombinants do. They produce uh, additional variations to what we would expect if crossing over did not occur. So this is how we get an increase in variability, an increase in the um, potential combinations that we have available within the gene pool. Obviously, this doesn't happen for all individuals, but if we're talking about the population, it just has to exist somewhere in the population, and now we have it as part of our gene pool. I think gene maps is an extension on, and it will come, kind of link into some of the things that we do later on this topic in the next uh, module. Um, but, but gene maps are quite useful application of the idea of recombinance. I hope that it's fairly obvious to you that if we have a long chromosome that has lots and lots of little genes along it, sections of DNA that are coding, and we call them uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Then what we're looking at in terms of crossing over is we're looking at how often these genes uh, stick together, basically, how often they're separated by crossing over and how often they stay together. So if I'm looking at um, A and J, for example, Crossing over can occur anywhere between A and J and will separate those two. So there's lots and lots of places where we can have crossing over occur and separate A and J. On the other hand, this is the only place that we can have crossing over occur that would separate I and J. Okay? In every of the every one of these other cases, one, two, three, four five, six, seven, and eight. In cases one to seven, I and J will stay together. And this is one of the ideas uh, that we've had for things like linked genes. Because one of the assumptions that Mendel made was an idea which he called independent assortment. And if random segregation relates more to the way that the chromosomes are separated out during the process of meiosis, then independent assortment is talking more about the genes themselves. So if we, if we think about, um, say, red hair and freckles, do these occur more often together? If they do, if the proportion is higher, then we would say they're linked. They're not, they're not independently assorting. They're actually assorting as a pair. They're going together. Um, into each of these gametes. That's not an independent assortment. So there are some places where Mendel's rules, as we, as we look at them in the upcoming videos, um, don't always hold up. And they're in these specific cases. Now, most of the time, um, whether they're a long way apart on the same chromosome, or as you can perhaps appreciate, if they're on different chromosomes, then obviously it will be independently assorted because they're not going to be affected in this way by crossing over. 
So independent assortment is a reasonable assumption, but there are points for where we have linked genes, which are genes that are very close together. And a lot of this work has actually been done on fruit flies. Uh, Thomas Morgan was the first one to look at the fruit flies and determine things like um, sex linkage. And we'll talk about that in future videos as well. But from our understanding of uh, fruit fly genes, we've been able to do these little gene maps and get an idea of exactly where each of these little traits is located and how close they are to one another. The numbers are reasonably easy to work out as well, um, but they're not something that's part of what we need to do now. So we might just leave it there uh, at the moment. Thanks for watching.